So, welcome, distinguished guests, family members, academic colleagues, students, supporters, and friends to the inaugural professorial lecture of Simon McKenzie, Professor of Criminology in the School of Social and Cultural Studies of the Wellington Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences. My name is Professor Grant Guilford. I'm Vice Chancellor of Teheringa Waka, Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand's globally ranked capital city university and New Zealand's top ranked university for the intensity of high quality research. It's my very great pleasure to host you all here today. I'd like to briefly introduce Professor McKenzie before handing over to him to deliver his lecture. Simon received his Bachelor of Laws with First Class Honours and Diploma in Legal Practice from the University of Edinburgh, after which he worked as a litigation lawyer for several years before coming back to academia, completing his Masters in Criminological Research at the University of Cambridge. He then made his way over to this side of the world, completing his PhD in Criminology at the University of Melbourne. He first became Professor of Criminology, Law and Society at the University of Glasgow in 2012, an exceptional achievement only eight years after finishing his PhD, and a recognition of how quickly he established his status as an internationally recognised scholar. In that same year, he travelled to Tehranga Waka for, his first, for the first time as a visiting scholar, and in 2016, he returned to our university, becoming Professor of Criminology in the School of Social and Cultural Studies. Professor McKenzie has written, edited, and contributed to a very significant number of books and journal articles. His early book, based on his PhD research, Going Gone, Regulating the Market in Illicit Antiquities, won the British Society of Criminology Book Prize for the best first book in 2005. And since then, he has gone on to win several other awards for his work. Simon studies white collar crime and organised crime, and his, and his most recent book, Transnational Criminology, published last year, pulled together these fields through his work on the underworld of the global economy, researching a variety of forms of international trafficking in drugs, humans, arms, wildlife, diamonds and art. He's on a number of editorial and international advisory boards, including the British Journal of Criminology, the Howard Journal of Crime and Justice, and the Australian and New Zealand Journal of Criminology. Professor McKenzie has attracted strong research funding throughout his career from a variety of sources, including prestigious national research councils, government agencies, the EU, and the United Nations. His current project is funded by the European Research Council, and it includes the research you will hear about this evening. Here at Teheringa Waka, Professor McKenzie's wide-ranging knowledge and skills have been a tremendous asset to the School of Social and Cultural Studies. He was the Director of the Institute of Criminology from 2017 to 2019 and was made Head of the School in 2020. He is a passionate lecturer and postgraduate supervisor and is known for his dedication to guiding the next generation of criminology scholars. In this lecture, Professor McKenzie will explore cryptocurrency scams and criminology. A sprawling and eclectic alternative financial system has developed in recent years, selling cutting-edge techno-investment schemes that are complex and high risk. Crime control is almost entirely absent from this new crypto economy, and it is full of scams. Professor McKenzie will discuss some of the scams currently taking place in cryptocurrency markets and show that the classic old social routines of criminal deception are flourishing in the new online economy. Please join me in welcoming Professor McKenzie to the podium. Kia ora. Na nami inui. Kia koutou katoa. Thank you everybody for coming along to listen to a story about uh, cryptocurrency and crime. Um, it's an inaugural. I've got some inaugurally type thank yous to say, but I'm going to leave them to the end because I don't want the beginning to be boring. But I'm going to break that rule at the beginning to say, welcome family. It's not every day you get to lecture in front of your family. Not even not every day. It's never. N never before. <laughs> never again. Probably. <laughs> Hopefully. Never again. Um, so welcome to them. The kids are looking forward to finding out how Lambos get on the moon. <laughs> so let's get right into it. This is from uh, the UK Daily Mail in the year 2000. 
20, uh, to just 20 years ago. And um, the Daily Mail was my parents' um, drug of choice, I think we would say. Mind-altering substance, perhaps, of choice uh, when I was growing up. So I joined the ranks quite early of people who doubted everything they read. Uh, it was quite good uh, academic training. And it turns out the internet wasn't a passing fad. It's become quite a big deal, actually. And one of the things that it's done is it has introduced, amongst many other things, uh, a, a market, a financial market, online in um, cryptocurrency. We'll call it crypto for short, from now on. So this is where two of my research interests come together, white collar crime and organized crime, as Grant said, particularly in relation to markets. And in this uh, lecture, we'll look at financial markets, one particular emerging financial market in crypto. And also, the reason why I've chosen this as an inaugural lecture is because it fits with one of my uh, methodological interests as well, my prime methodological interest, which is ethnography. So criminologists use lots of different uh, techniques in order to interrogate crime. There's statistics, there's experiments sometimes, uh, interviews, lots of interviews. Um, ethnography is about getting involved in the scenes where the crime happens, trying to get as close to the crime as possible, understanding it in its own terms, um, learning by doing, not obviously doing the crime, but doing in the sense of being a part of the scene where the crime is happening. And so you learn um, the emotions at play and the feelings and, the, uh, and what's relevant to the people who are in and around the space. So that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to talk about ethnographic research on crime in relation to one particular subculture within the economy, which is cryptocurrency trading. We're going to look at the life of the crypto trader. And what we'll find is that we've got a bleeding edge technology here and an emerging financial marketplace, but um, the crime emerging with it is really not particularly new. Scams are very old social routines, drawing on classic themes of confidence and deception. And so what first appears uh, perhaps to be a super advanced cybercrime actually turns out to be best understood as just the latest installment in a long social story, the protagonist of which is the con artist. So I'm going to talk about three things today, cryptocurrency, scams, and memes. And memes are these internet jokes, these little pictures, and they're mostly the same. The picture doesn't change, but the caption changes. Uh, they are endlessly repeated in cryptocurrency forums. They're traded like almost like currency themselves. And the reason I'm including these is, uh, is twofold, really. Firstly, because I want to do that ethnographic thing of giving you a feel for what it's like to be in the cryptocurrency trading space, and memes is, a, is about the best way I can think of to do that. Um, and secondly, a, a more sort of intellectual reason, they helped me to make a point which is really one of the underlying themes of the whole lecture, which is about classic structure and endless variety. And I'm going to suggest to you that cryptocurrency and also scams have the same thing that memes have, which is a classic basic structure to them, several sort of core themes, an endless variety in which they manifest themselves in the world. The guy, the, the old guy is called uh, Hide the Pain Harold. And his story is that he was one of these stock catalog uh, photograph models, and, and um, he was told just to do a sort of smile that would use it, go for anything, use it for any catalog. And he signed off on that thing, saying, you will use it for whatever you like. Um, and the internet didn't take long to determine that he seemed to be hiding some sort of deep inner anguish <laughs> with that smile. And, uh, and so he became Hyde the Pain Harold, and he was quite upset about it for a bit. And, uh, and now he's got into it. He, he's sort of in on the joke, so he, so he thinks it's all right now. So um, we'll come to see that the, the, that theme uh, represents cryptocurrency scams. And therefore, scams can be scams in crypto in particular can be thought of as a kind of meme crime, uh, a basic architecture of social deception played out over and over again in glorious variety, thousands of minor tweaks on a few major underlying criminal routines. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's start at the beginning, um, well, my beginning in relation to all of this anyway. Uh, picture the scene. It was January 2018, and Sally had uh, gone away for uh, three nights, I think it was, to Australia, and she'd taken uh, the oldest with her and left me with the two wee ones uh, who were about one and three at the time. So I was putting them to bed at um, about 7.30 or so, like a responsible parent, and then I had the rest of the evening to myself. 
and the devil makes work for idle hands. And so on the first night I was reading uh, the newspaper and I came across a story about a cryptocurrency called Ripple. And the reporter was saying that Ripple was the new Bitcoin. And I didn't really know much about the old Bitcoin at that point. I, I, I knew a couple of things, probably the same sorts of things that everybody knows. Um, I knew that it had gone up a lot in value and I'd missed out on it, like everybody has. Uh, here it is, going up a lot in value. Up to 60,000 60, per Bitcoin recently. And the second thing that I knew relatedly was the story uh, about the Bitcoin pizzas. Uh, in 2010, this 22nd of May 2010, a software developer called Laszlo went to Papa John's and uh, placed a $30 pizza order and paid in Bitcoin. And Bitcoin at the time was uh, about a third of a cent. And so uh, he paid 10,000 Bitcoin. And on the 22nd of May, every year after that, the crypto community comes together to have a bit of a laugh about how much those pizzas would have cost in, in today's Bitcoin money. Uh, and this year gone past, it was about $400 million. <laughs> so those are expensive pizzas. So I was reading about Ripple in January 2018, and to say the least, I was intrigued. Um, I thought, I'll just look into it. Just that way you do. I'll just find out a bit more about it. And so I spent the next few nights finding out more about it. It was kind of pretty complex at the time. It was quite hard, actually, to work out what it was, uh, how to get it. And to cut a long story, you can see how the story is going to end, can you? Because it's not going to be, I didn't buy any. <laughs> so at the end of the lecture, um, I brought some. And I got to that point where I thought, I've just put so much time into this now. I might as well get some. Um, and so I did. Uh, I bought some Ripple. You can imagine the conversation I had with Sally when she came back from, uh, from Australia. You, what, you, you, you've you sent some, at the, time, at the time you couldn't, getting the fiat money, getting your, your, your money into crypto was actually quite a difficult thing to do. You had to, it was a, a sort of nefarious, it wasn't nefarious at all actually, but it seemed quite under, under, under the radar, peer-to-peer -peer sharing network. You had to send your money off to someone and they would send you Bitcoin back. So I sent my money off through this network to some dude in Hong Kong. And, and um, Sally was like, what, you've sent our money off to Hong Kong? And uh, to, for what, ripples, what? So I, I said there'll be a lot about memes. There'll be a lot about memes. Um, one of the memes that you probably come across if you exist on the internet at all is how it started, how it's going. Here's a, here's a how it started. <laughs> this is Ripple. Ripple went up um, from about half a cent in the 2017s to uh, over three dollars, so it went up over 600 times. So if you'd put a thousand dollars in when it was half a cent, you'd have 600 grand a couple of years later. I didn't do that. <laughs> um, I got in <laughs> at three dollars ten, and I was looking at this and thinking, "This is the investment I've been looking for my entire life. It just goes up." I'm going to start, I, I could go on about it, but I've done some visuals for you to uh, help you to understand what was going on in my head at the time. <laughs> so I said, we're going to look, to Sally, we're going to look back on this. This is going to be an auspicious day, the day that I pressed that send button and bought that ripple. So that's how it started. This is how it's going. I do look back on it, not as I'd imagined. <laughs> That's my entry point, you'll remember. <laughs> Turns out there's a meme for that. Uh, there's actually a lot of memes for that because as it shakes out, I'd bought not only at the top of Ripple, I'd bought at the top of everything. <laughs> the entire crypto market collapsed in uh, early, mid-2018 descended into this mire, um, and uh, so there's, I like to paint Harold <laughs> again, <laughs> smiling through the trouble. Um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, everything just fell apart. I, I, the, the previous chart that I showed you about Bitcoin was the logarithmic scale. Well, I'll show you again, oops, there it is, which is the, um, uh, it goes up by a factor of 10, and it kind of masks the massive volatility involved. It makes it look like Bitcoin's just grinding up over the years, which overall it kind of has been. The, the reality, the proper scale that you want to look at it is the linear scale, which is like that. You get these enormous parabolic bull runs and crashes in 
interspersed with huge periods of massive stagnation where basically nothing much happens and people give up and projects die. They call it crypto winter. So I entered crypto winter after 2018 um, in a state of reasonable disgust about my participation in the whole thing. I was down about 90%. Uh, and I deleted the app from my phone and didn't really check it. And every now and again, Sally would say, how's the crypto going? <laughs> <laughs> I go, yeah, it's going well, yeah. <laughs> Are we Bitcoin millionaires yet? No, no, not yet. <laughs> not yet, give it time. Um, and then, as you can see from the chart, it all came roaring back in late 2020. Um, and we're all back in the game. I say we're all back in the game. I'm not back in the game as much as I should be because um, out of all of the top cryptocurrencies, one of them got sued by the Securities and Exchange Commission in the United States which has massively suppressed the price. It's some, like an ongoing jarndice, jarndice situation where it's just sort of never-ending litigation. Um, and that cryptocurrency was Ripple, so <laughs> lucky old me. So I didn't quite make it back to the top, but, um, but lots of other people did. And the reason it went up as much as it did was the DeFi summer of 2020. What on earth was that? Well, I'll explain it. In my 2018 foray into the market, um, when you wanted to buy a cryptocurrency, you had to do it on a centralized exchange. This is a centralized exchange. Centralized exchange is owned by somebody or some company, and it matches up buyers and sellers. It looks quite complicated, it kind of is, I suppose, but the reality of what it's doing is that it's a bit like a foreign currency exchange or a stock market exchange. The green people want to buy, the red people want to sell. You tell it if you want to buy something or sell something at a certain price, It'll wait until somebody wants to do the other side of that trade and it'll pair you up together. Job done. Um, in the DeFi summer, DeFi for decentralized finance as opposed to centralized finance, in the decentralized finance summer of 2020, uh, decentralized exchanges came onto the scene, DEXs. And a DEX, unlike a centralized exchange, is pretty much fully automated. Nobody really runs it. Somebody sets it up and it goes on automated algorithms and smart contracts. It basically runs itself. It's decentralized. Nobody's in charge. Here's an example of a decentralized exchange. It looks much um, more basic. This is one called Uniswap, which is a pretty basic sort of token swap interface uh, with a nice picture of a unicorn. And um, these DEXs don't match up buyers and sellers in the way that centralized exchanges do. In order to make swaps, they need a thing called a pool of liquidity. In other words, they hold the tokens. And if you want to buy the tokens from them, you're buying from the DEX directly, rather than pairing up with any other person behind the scenes. So where does that liquidity pool come from in a DEX? Where do, where do the tokens come from that it uses? Um, well, two places. Firstly, a person who launches a cryptocurrency will put the tokens into the DEX to allow it to trade with them. And secondly, it comes from us, the traders. We can loan our tokens into the DEX. Why do we do that? Well, every time there's a swap happening, somebody trades, we get the, there's a little fee that's levied, a, a transaction fee, and we get a little cut of it. So you're a liquidity provider. You give your tokens, you lend your tokens to the DEX to allow it to have that liquidity pool that it can use to, to trade with. So, since one of the main tenets of decentralization is um, open source coding, immediately upon anything being launched, it's forked or copied. And this happened with Uniswap. It was copied by SushiSwap and TacoSwap and BurgerSwap and BakerySwap. And then, Pan the really popular one, PancakeSwap. Why are they all to do with food? I don't know. Um, I think it starts off, somebody does a food thing just at random, and then everybody else following that seems to go, eh, the food thing's working, uh, let's, let's just go with the food. Um, PancakeSwap is, is a good example of, of the, the incredible vortex that, that's happened around DeFi and what has happened, the whirlwind opportunities for an investment. I'll, I'll tell you kind of roughly how it works. So PancakeSwap, you, it's a, there's a swap interface like there was with Uniswap. You'd be a liquidity provider, you can loan your tokens into PancakeSwap, and it will give you in return a thing called an LP token, which is like a marker for the tokens that you have lended into the platform. You've got your LP token or tokens. You can then do a thing with that called yield farming, where you put it into the yield farm on PancakeSwap, and you get interest, a rate of return, which is paid in cake, which is the native to token of, of PancakeSwap. 
are you keeping up? <laughs> now, if you're starting to think this is all sounding a little bit wild and crazy, let's add another layer to it. One of the other things that you can do in DeFi is if you happen to have a pet rock or a crypto punk, CryptoPunks were given away for free in 2017. You could have downloaded one for nothing. It would now be worth millions of dollars. Uh, so it's not unthinkable that you might have one. I don't. Um, or Pet Rock, even, which is worth 100,000. Uh, still a bit mad. Still, uh, uh, I don't have any. Um, but if you did happen to have one of these things, you could go to uh, another bit of DeFi, which is a collateralized lending platform. And you could put up your... Um, Rock. Actually, it's a, basically what it is, an NFT. It's a, there's a whole other talk about NFTs, but it's a picture of a rock, essentially, a, a JPEG of a rock. So you lodge your JPEG of a rock with the lending platform, and it will lend you money based on the perceived value of that JPEG of the rock, which is, for, the, for that particular rock, 100,000. If it's a responsible lending platform, it will give you maybe 25%. There are also irresponsible lending platforms in De DeFi, because nobody really controls the space, that'll give you a, an under-collateralized loan. They'll lend you more than the value of your rock, which I think we can all agree is already quite overheated in, in terms of, of its valuation. So you might get anywhere from $25,000 to $150,000, uh, and you've lodged your rock with this lending platform. You take that money, you put it in PancakeSwap. PancakeSwap gives you an LP token. You put that LP token back into the yield farm, and pretty soon you've turned a rock into cake, and <laughs> you're loving it. It's great, and you've forgotten where the rock was and where the money came from, and you've got to pay back that loan at some point in the future, but you don't care because it's all good because you're rolling in cake. Um, <laughs> and it sounds ridiculous, but cake's worth a lot of money now. <laughs> and pancake is worth a lot of money now. Um, the total value locked in PancakeSwap, in other words, the value of all of the crypto tokens that people have invested in the platform through all these various sort of mechanisms, is $9 billion. Now, by comparison, ANZ is New Zealand's biggest KiwiSaver scheme. They've got lots of little KiwiSaver versions under the whole ANZ brand. But if you take every KiwiSaver thing that ANZ does, the total value locked in that is 11 billion US dollars. So ANZ KiwiSaver, 11 billion. Pancake, 9 billion, almost as much. KiwiSaver's been going since 2007. I think, 14 years or so. Pancake's been going since late last year, and it only actually got popular early this year. It's going ballistic. Now, uh, the next question, I guess, is um, what kind of uber-sophisticated and far-sighted investor is doing this arbitraging of rocks and cakes and, uh, and all this sort of stuff? Uh, surely there's some sort of entry requirements for, for this. And the frightening answer is, because it's decentralized, there isn't. Anybody can do it. Actually, there's kids doing it sometimes. Um, in principle, DeFi is about removing the institutional barriers to access to finance. So you can do all of this without a credit check, without uh, any sort of bank as an intermediary, without character references. And the risks are huge, obviously. Um, and in DeFi, the risks are all yours because in a decentralized economy, you're completely in charge of your money and your trades. There's nobody looking out for you. There's no customer service desk that you can phone up if something goes wrong. Um, you're under 16, welcome in. You are um, using money that you can't afford to lose. Well, that's not, uh, not such a great idea, but it's going to be treated exactly the same as anybody else's money. It's basically an active trading market where anyone can enter, and the requirements seem to be a, you've got a computer. B, your risk assessment threshold is somewhere way out in the left field. Um, if you send the money to the wrong address, it's gone. You're not getting that back. If you um, surrender possession of your tokens to the DEX in the way that you're doing when you're doing all of this, you're giving, you're lending your tokens to the DEX, if that DEX gets hacked, if it implodes for some reason, it liquidates, it goes bankrupt, if anything happens, game over. Um, back on the centralized exchanges, you remember those, you used to have to, if you wanted to list a token, you used to have to go through a sort of vetting process. It wasn't a really severe vetting process, but there was a process for getting listed. You had to get some sort of approval to get listed. Uh, on a DEX, because nobody's in charge, anybody can make a token, and anybody can list it. 
And so if people are listing hundreds of tokens a day, and a massive proportion of those are, at the moment, scams, and there's really no restriction on launching it. Everyone's looking for moonshots. This is a, there's big established projects, they're, they're referred to um, in a sort of absurdist stock market jargon uh, uh, thing as uh, blue chips, like Bitcoin and Ethereum. And they're gonna go up in value, you would think, but they're not really gonna go up in, uh, as quickly um, as you need in order to get uh, your gazillions. What's gonna happen is that you need to try to find the gems among the many hundreds of tiny projects that are just starting out, because those are your moonshots, those are the ones that are gonna potentially go from nothing to exponentially massive in a, in a, a reasonably short space of time, you would hope. And uh, around that little bit of the market, the bottom bit of the market, there's a lot of hype. It's not a demure kind of hype. It's quite a crazy kind of hype. It's hugely risky and speculative. It's a bit like gambling on penny stocks. Um, a large number, as I say, of those little startup things that you're gonna try and invest in are gonna be scams. Traders refer to these low cap speculative coins as shit coins. Cover your ears, kids. Um, and uh, you ape into them in the language. So you ape into a shit coin if you uh, are desperately trying to basically gamble on the fact that this thing is gonna shoot up in value. There's, I can see some, some people sort of giggling at this and that's because I know that you're basically involved in this sort of stuff, right? <laughs> so, so you recognize the, the, the language that I'm talking about. Um, so that's, that's seen as being a high risk, high reward, Degen activity, degen being short for degenerate, which is what you are if you take part in crypto speak in this sort of uh, highly, highly speculative end of an already highly speculative market. Um, degen, is, it sounds quite pejorative, but actually it's more of a sort of term of endearment uh, as it's used in, in uh, the crypto world. We're all degenerates. So the longest running meme in crypto is of course the Lambo. If you catch a moonshot, maybe you'll get enough money to be able to buy a Lamborghini. Lambos are going to the moon, they're on the moon, and what you buy when you get to the moon. There's even a website where if you've got some Bitcoin, you can put it in and they'll tell you what kind of Lambo you can afford with it. But will you get your Lambo on the moon by aping into shit coins? <laughs> this is the question. Well, you can try, but there's a lot of uh, hurdles to overcome first. <laughs> And one of them is to try to avoid becoming the victim of crime. So let's start, I'm gonna start with three examples in general to show you how tricky this market is to navigate as an investor. And these three examples will show uh, three things. Firstly, market abuse is normalized. Secondly, you can lose money very quickly and you'll come to expect that as part of the normal course of trading if, uh, if you're trading in crypto for any sort of length of time. And thirdly, the main method of crime control is looking out for number one and uh, having your wits about you. There's no real sort of official uh, type of, of crime control to speak of in the space. So let's look at the first one of those, the normalization of market abuse. There are whales in the market, so-called whales, who have very, very large numbers of uh, any given token. And this chart here is uh, a thing called Truebit. And you can see it's kind of trending up and there's a green grind up there. And then just before May the 4th, there's a big green line that goes straight down from the top right down to the bottom. And what's happened there is that a whale who's got a huge number of the tokens of this um, Truebit stuff, uh, uh, by, in a way that I won't go into, uh, has decided once it's got up to a certain price that he's gonna dump it. And so he dumps all of his coins at the top and it crashes the price. It doesn't crash it all the way down, but it crashes it a, a, a good bit down. Other traders will have set uh, trailing stop losses, maybe five or 10% trailing behind the price as it is. What that means is that if the price goes down, their tokens will be automatically sold, just like stock market stop losses to try and protect you against those sorts of losses. So if the whale sells all of his coins and dumps through those stop losses, all those tokens get sold as well, and that dumps the price even further. At this point, all the regular Joes, like me, I was watching this as it happened, look at it and think, oh my God, this is going to zero. This is just going straight down. And it was a massive red line down the middle of the screen. And you, so you try and panic sell everything because you just got to get out before it goes to, goes to zero. Um, I didn't manage that because my computer interface froze up because so many people were trying to <laughs> sell out of it. So I, I didn't even, fortunately in the end, as it turns out, I didn't manage to do it. Um, 
Uh, so, it got, so yeah, the, the price dumps incredibly quickly through this manipulation. But um, the line's not, not red, it's green. Why is it green? Well, because it went right down from $1.40 to 20 cents, and at the bottom, the whale that sold at the top bought back in again. Took all the money that it got at the top, this was like five minutes ago, bought back in at the bottom, exponentially increased uh, six to 10 times the number of tokens that he owns in the thing. It goes shooting back up again. He's basically taking the tokens off all the panic sellers, like me, as would have been, but uh, didn't quite manage it. And then after that, normal, normal trading resumes. Um, so this kind of manipulation it sort of hangs over the market. And the, the feeling for minnow traders is that um, uh, you're being thrown around on these sort of waves of other people's trades that you can't even think about getting close to with the sort of volume that you're talking about. And um, so you come to terms basically with the fact that the market is manipulated. And, and that kind of manipulation is important context for understanding scams because um, it dilutes the outrage or the surprise that you feel if you would become a victim of some sort of criminal event because you are anyway thinking that other, the market is full of people who are deliberately deploying underhand tactics in order to try to maneuver you into bad trades. So you don't quite feel so um, offended by the whole thing if, wow. if manipulation veers into very serious criminality. Point number two, the normalization of losing money in a flash. Sometimes projects just give up. Uh, the developer and the marketing guys uh, sort of say, what the hell with this? Um, but we've, we've had enough, we'll sell all of our stuff. <laughs> and that's the end of it. The first time this happened to me, I thought, I, like, can they do this? Is this, is this allowed? Um, well, yeah, apparently they can. Um, here's an example of one that happened to me. You um, come home from work and you see that the chart has just gone through the floor and you think, oh God, please say the chart's broken. And then you go and search around on Twitter or the Telegram to try and find out what's happened and you get a message like this. The future is quite dark uh, and uh, we're abruptly ending. And, uh, and so that's it, game over, end of. I think I can make the dragon script, there you go. Uh, so there are a multitude of ways that if you exist in crypto space for any length of time, you can encounter catastrophic loss. Um, and you have to countenance that as a possible outcome because it, it, it's always there hanging over you. Again, that's important context for scams because having come to expect some instance of very serious loss, as part of the whole normal course of trading. When scams occur, their importance sort of fades into the background of um, that uh, tapestry of a very high risk environment. Finally, uh, in this trifecta of uh, sort of contextual things for scams, uh, there's no real crime control in the market and you've got to look out for yourself. This is a, a, a nice project called Sol Starter. There's a, a, a startup blockchain that's very popular and trendy called Solana and everybody's been waiting for the Sol Starter project and here it is and we're all buying in, lots of buys. Um, great, so let's get stuck in and um, more people keep buying after you and the price goes up and then at some point you get to the point where you think, well, safety first, I'll take a bit of profit off the top here. I'll sell, sell, sell something just to, to um, make sure that I'm, I'm not got everything riding on this. And you go to sell, and you find that you can't sell because it's a scam. It's a scam token, and the developer has programmed it so that you can buy it, but you can't sell it. And that's why that's all buys. Usually in any sort of regular trading, it would be interspersed with red sells. And so then you go, because there's no sort of chat interface in the charting mechanism, you go and you have a bit of a look around and you find the real soul starter on Twitter and, uh, and on Telegram saying, um, we haven't launched yet. Be careful, there's a lot of scams out there. Don't, don't buy the stuff, please. So we've got a, a few Wild West things building up here, don't we, in relation to crypto. We've got rampant price manipulation. We've got projects getting liquidated at a moment's notice. We've got cyber crimes to do with the way the technology can be exploited. Um, we're building a picture of a space without too many rules in which scammers find ideal victims, people with uh, a pretty loose risk radar who know that the market is seriously manipulated. Uh, they're not really expecting fairness or good behavior from everyone else, people who are used to losing money and who treat it as just part of the regular um, grind of, of being in the market. Uh, a space where people dream of Lambos on the moon and they chase the latest hype where they're not gonna call the police because 
uh, they're used to this sort of pervasive dodginess and they have a sense that there's, there's no point in reporting any of this sort of stuff. And to cap it all, as if that's not enough, you've got the anonymity of the internet, which means that in these chat forums that I'm talking about, the developers, the scam developers, can get right up close to you, they can talk to you, they can persuade you to give them your money in various different ways, and then they can disappear. And it's all pseudonymous, you'll never know who they were, you'll never know where they were, um, they can just disappear into thin air. I was looking for a, um, a slide to, 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 to sum up the anonymity of the internet, and, um, and then this morning, uh, a good one popped up on one of the crypto forums. I'll just have a drink of water and I'll let you read that. <laughs> so the scene is set for scams to flourish. Let's take a look at some of them. I've, I've split the scams up into, th um, into three categories, advanced fee fraud, rug pulls, and first in best dressed, and I've got two examples of, um, of each of them. Now, let's look at the giveaway scam to start off with. The most basic thing a scam has to do is to seem legitimate. If you can spot it as being an obvious scam, then you're not really going to uh, take part in it. For the giveaway scam, the way that people seem legitimate is they uh, set up fake Twitter accounts in the names of big crypto influencers and players. And um, they'll say that they're going to do a giveaway in order to try to promote crypto. You send them one Bitcoin, they'll send you five back, whatever. Uh, the variant of it is, and you send them the Bitcoin, you never see it again. So one of the things that you find when you look at the Twitter handles of some of the big influencers is that they are pending to their Twitter hand, these are the legit guys, I'm not giving anything away. This is this, uh, don't think I'm, 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 I'm nobody's giving anything away. Um, and if, you, if somebody's trying to give you something, then it's a scam. So the giveaway scam is a, is a form of advanced fee fraud, which is a category of crime that covers uh, any sort of myriad version of the same basic premise. I've got something valuable to give you, uh, so to release it, send me a payment. You send me a little of something, I'll send you a lot back. If you think back to the days before effective spam filters, you used to get all those emails from people that were constantly wanting to give you money, and they had a trust fund somewhere, and they would need just a small amount of money to unlock the legal fees to, uh, that was advanced fee fraud, um, and the giveaway scam in crypto is of the same type. In many scams, and the giveaway is a good example, we have an offer that seems to be too good to be true. I'm sure you know the, the consumer awareness advice, which is if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. It's very hard to live by that advice, though, um, as a human being, because temptation gets the better of us sometimes, and it can outweigh reticence and, and rationality. And so if the offer seems beneficial enough, a lot of us will persuade ourselves that it's legitimate just because we so desperately want it to be so. And so we change reality to fit with what we'd like to believe instead of doing what we should do, which is change what we believe in order to fit reality. Uh, the old scam literature calls this the triumph of hope over experience. Offers are, are also sometimes made to be time sensitive. Um, you're given the idea that if you pass up the chance, somebody else will jump in and, and uh, so bet you better be quick. Now, um, quite obviously, I guess, Time-sensitive offers are hardly limited just to scams in crypto or scams anywhere else. Time-limited offers are everywhere in uh, the consumer world. It's quite a well-used persuasive technique. And that kind of dilutes your capacity to identify scams because if that sort of stuff is everywhere in conventional society, maybe this is a legitimate offer. Maybe this person does want to do, do a giveaway. Maybe this is a time-sensitive, I better jump on it quick situation that's, that's legit. So there's three core scams, uh, core themes of scams to get us started, an appearance of legitimacy, an offer that seems too good to be true, and a time pressure. And uh, the latest high profile case of this happened when Elon Musk was on Saturday Night Live, which was I think May of, uh, 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 of this year. And at the time that Elon went, he was the guest host on Saturday Night Live, and he's quite a big fan of Bitcoin. He's been promoting Dogecoin and other cryptos as well. And uh, some scammers went into his Twitter feed. They set up fake Saturday Night Live accounts, and they pointed people towards this giveaway page where they said, Elon Musk is giving away Bitcoin. And you give him one Bitcoin, he'll send you 10. Anything you send, basically, he'll multiply it by 10. 
I found out about this because some poor guy in the UK was in the papers because he'd sent off 10 Bitcoin hoping to get 100 back. So that was 400,000 pounds that he just sent off into, into nowhere. This guy is the, the unlikely looking billionaire owner of uh, one of the biggest cryptocurrencies called Cardano. And he gives these kind of live stream updates to all of his followers about what's happening with the project every week or so. He's actually giving this update live streamed, but he's not giving it there. He's giving it on his own website and the scammers are pulling the live stream in real time through to their own website, sticking it in this thing with gifts all around it and offers to, um, to do giveaways in order to try to entice you into thinking that Charles Hoskinson is going to give you some Cardano, which of course he's not. And we're not learning. You would think that the more this happens, the more people would get wise to it. But actually, it's just getting worse. And we're, the figures are 2021. I mean, we're only um, halfway through 2021. So I, I fear, of course, that that's going to get a lot bigger before the year's end. So that's an example of a scam where you, the victim, think you've get, you get an amazingly good deal. It's too good to resist. Uh, you can't, too good to think rationally about. But there are other scams where that desire to get the best side of a bargain goes even further, where you're prepared to cheat, or you're prepared to take advantage of someone uh, to get the good end of the deal. And the cry for help is one of those scams. I've got Robert Redford here doing the cry for help way back when. See if you can work out what he's up to before the reveal. Suckering! Don't let him get away, he's got my wallet. Well, he's got all my money. My wallet! We He's got, got my wallet. wallet! We got it. Give what it happened? Me. Give it to me, please. You get you with a knife? Hey, you sit tight, old man. You need a doctor. I'll call a cop. No, 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 no cops. You want about the law or something? No, it's okay. Are you nuts carrying a water around like that in a neighborhood like this? No wonder you got hit. Thanks. I'm obliged to you. But I gotta get going. Ah. You ain't going nowhere. Oh. Let me see. I got her. Gotta run some slots down in West Bend for a mob here. I got a little behind in the payoffs, so they figure I've been holding out on them. They gave me till four to come up with the cash. They don't get it. I'm dead. Yeah, it don't look good, Gramps. It's almost four now. I'll give you and your friend a hundred bucks to deliver it for me. I don't know. That mug to hit you is mad enough at me already. Well, what if he's around a corner waiting with some friends? He won't know you're carrying it. Come on, you gotta help me out. Hey, I'm sorry, pal. I'm gonna maybe help you get fixed up, get to a doctor, but I ain't about to walk in and no knife for you. How about you? All you gotta do is put it in the door slot. I'll give you the whole hundred. Hey, what makes you think you can trust him? He didn't do shit. Hey, butt out, chicken liver. I gave him back the wallet, didn't I? How far is this place? 1811 Mason. Put it in box 3C. You won't have no trouble. There's $5,000 there. And here's 100 bucks for you. Okay, old man, I'll make your drop for you. And don't worry. You can trust me. Hey, hey, if those goons decide to search you, you ain't gonna get far carrying it there. What'll we do? You got a bag or something? How about a handkerchief? Here's a handkerchief. Here, yeah, give it to me. Give me the money. Just hurry, will you? You got any more? You better give it all to me if you want to keep it. They think I've been holding out on them. My wife got sick and I had to pay the bill. I wasn't holding out on them. Stuff it I down always your pants, been good yeah. for the money before, like but that. this got time it? they gave uh -huh. you that yeah. line. Hurry, will you? Ain't a tough guy in the world that's gonna frisk you there. Mm. Thanks. Yeah. Where to? Which way is Mason? 20 blocks south. Okay, go north. Joliet Station. Back. Right. <laughs> What's so funny? I just made the world's easiest five grand. <laughs> Come on, hold on. So that's the cry for help scam. The scammer feigns some sort of vulnerability, asks for your assistance. You decide that you're not going to help him. You're actually going to rip him off. Uh, and you think you're ripping him off, but actually he's ripping you off. This is the uh, crypto version of the cry for help scam. There's two things you need to understand in order to make sense of the way this all works. Firstly, 
you keep your cryptocurrency in an online wallet. It's like an app on your phone or a little thing in your browser. It's a bit like internet banking. Uh, you look at it, it looks like, like, if you look at internet banking, it looks like your money's there, but your money's not there, your money's in the bank. Well, with um, crypto, it looks like you, your coins are in your wallet. They're not there, it's just an interface to see. Your, your coins are on the blockchain somewhere. And uh, every wallet is backed up with a seed phrase, a passcode. So you can recreate the wallet anywhere with the seed phrase. If you want to have it on your laptop and on your um, desktop, then you just download the software, put the seed phrase in on your laptop. You've made the wallet there. It'll show you all your coins because it has the same access to it that anything else does. If your computer blows up, you can get a new computer. You can download the software, put the seed phrase in, and uh, it's all good. So the one thing that you know in crypto, the first thing you learn is you never tell anyone your seed phrase. Because if they've got your seed phrase, they can download the software, they can put the seed phrase in, they've got your access to your wallet, they've got access to your tokens, um, and you're in a bit of trouble. So here we have, apparently, a victim in a chat forum saying, something's wrong with my wallet, can somebody help me? Here's my seed phrase. Oh, big mistake. Um, the second thing you need to know uh, in order to understand the scam is obviously people then look at that and if they're mean-minded, they think, I'm gonna steal his crypto. So they put the seed phrase into the wallet, they make his wallet on their computer, they find that they can't steal the crypto because, and this is the second thing you need to know, um, on a blockchain like Ethereum, you need to have a small amount of gas to pay the transaction fee. If you wanna move any coins around or do any swaps or anything, you gotta have a small amount of Ether, which is the base currency, in your wallet in order to make it all work. And this guy has loaded up his wallet with $10,000, in this case of crypto, but no ether. So you can see it, you can't steal it. Easily fixed, all you need to do is send some ether into the wallet for the gas, then you can take it out. Ah, but he's made a bot that monitors the wallet. Every time any ether goes into the wallet, it immediately pings it out to his own wallet. So the cry for help, you think you're stealing his crypto, he's stealing your ether. And because all this is on the blockchain, you can look at the transactions that go through these wallets because the blockchain is all public. This is that wallet. This is page one of, you know, page three of six, 284 transactions at the time that that snapshot was taken. And you just need to look at the ins and outs, not really anything else. It's just ether in, ether out, ether in, ether out. There were loads of people who were trying to steal this guy's crypto. <laughs> and they all lost their ether. Rug pulls. The slow token rug sit well. I mean, to start off with, let's just say, in terms of, of uh, things with a long history, exit scams, rug pulls, are a thing that's got a long history. Uh, pulling people into a, a good standing investment and then taking all the money and running, that's a, that's a pretty old uh, routine. So, in slow token rug sales, um, what happens is that the developer who has launched a new token has actually kept a whole load of the tokens for himself. He's got maybe 80% of the tokens probably, and he's sold 20% of them. You might not know that he's only sold the 20%. And while you're buying, he's selling. And he's selling over a long period of time. It's like a slow puncture in a balloon. So you're basically buying the tokens that he's selling over time. It's never gonna come back up because he's got so many of these things. It's just gonna end in zero eventually. It's just a matter of time before it does. And he's in the Telegram group, and he's chatting away while he's stealing your money. And this is what Irvin Goffman called cooling the market in a paper that's become a classic in criminology. Cooling the market was the process of staying with the victim during and after a scam and uh, trying to make sure they didn't call the police. So the way con artists would do this was through what Goffman referred to as cooling them out, or in his other words, helping them adapt to failure and educating them in the philosophy of taking a loss. <laughs> So the scammer would persuade the victim that maybe it was an all unfortunate mishap and the surefire money-making scheme had gone wrong somehow and he knew the risks and, and um, he only had himself, himself to blame, should chalk it up to experience and, and move on with life, that sort of thing. And this process of cooling out is everywhere in society. Again, like the consumer um, high pressure sales situation, if you've ever been told by a girlfriend or a boyfriend that it's not you, it's them, then you've been cooled out. Uh, if you've ever phoned up to try to get a refund for your washing machine and they said, well, you know, they'd be a lot more expensive if you made them properly these days, nothing's supposed to last for longer than three years and maybe it's an opportunity to get a new one and you know, cool, cooling out is everywhere. And crypto scammers are experts in cooling out. They'll be in the chat and they'll be telling you that the dip is just early buyers 
selling. They'll be saying that it pumped a lot at the beginning and it's kind of natural that there's a bit of a dip. They'll say there's loads of other successful tokens out there that have gone on to great things and in the beginning they dipped. You've got to have diamond hands, not paper hands. In other words, you get scared money doesn't make money. You've got to hold on and get through it. And all the time they're selling the ground out from underneath your feet. And eventually it'll become clear that it's not going to recover and they might say, well, crypto's risky and everybody knows that. And they'll say, I was heavily invested in this and I've lost as much as anyone. And there'll always be other opportunities, so let's just go and look for the next moonshot and try and make it all back. So the idea of cooling out is as relevant to crypto crimes in 2021 as it was to the con games 100 years ago. And then there's fast drugs or, or liquidity pools. Now, this is where your knowledge of uh, pancakes and unicorns and token uh, Tokens in, in DeFi swaps, come, you remember that, don't you? Yeah, of course you do. Um, that mechanism creates a rug opportunity, and so here's how it goes. A developer will make a public sale of their token, and in order to put liquidity in a pool, you need to put in, if it's uh, Ethereum, say, let's call their token that they're selling rug, they're selling a rug token, and so they'll put a matching amount of, of rug and ether in the liquidity pool. Now you wanna buy rug, you pay an ether, you take out some rug. You want to sell the rug back, sell the rug back, get some ether in return. In the early stages of any, uh, any sale, what's going to happen is everybody's going to be buying rug and everybody's going to pay an ether to buy the rug. At some point, there's so much ether in that liquidity pool and if it's not locked up, there's a technical way you can lock it up but it doesn't always happen. The developer, who's the one who put it in, can just pull it all out take everything away with them, massive exit scam, and that's the kind of chart you get uh, on that occasion. This is, this is a guy called uh, War on Rugs, who was like a vigilante type, who prior to this had gone around Twitter sort of auditing, he's an unofficial self-appointed auditor of um, projects that might be scams, and he would alert people to the fact that some things might be scams. So he was kind of a, a seemingly a force for good. And then he launched his own token a couple of months ago, and he rugged it. <laughs> and if you, you read down the bottom, he's saying, since we can't do anything and there's no regulation in place, I decided to show you so you understand that you should stop being a clown and aping into anything. <laughs> Hopefully after this, you don't trust anyone anymore. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. <laughs> Uh, I guess, I mean, I should say I'm not, with these burning elbows and everything, remember, I'm not really, make, I'm not trying to make light of this. This is a very serious amount of money being lost in all of this. These crypto memes are crypto memes. I'm not, I'm anyway, going away from this lecture thinking, that was quite interesting, but man, he must have spent a lot of time making those dragon gifts. I, I, didn't, I didn't make them. They're, uh, they're the work of, of the crypto market itself. So, um, this is some on-chain analysis where uh, people were looking at the number of rugs. In 24 hours, 3,003 transactions of total liquidity removal. An address that's literally spending all day um, minting shit coins and potentially netting six figures by rug pulling innocent bystanders. Um, and then somebody's a bit rude about the innocent bystanders. And yeah, there's memes about it, of course. Um, I mean, I suppose you do get a bit hardened to it uh, the more it carries on. But bear in mind what I said earlier about the opportunities that are down at that very low level, people aping into things. It's very hard to tell in the early stages of tiny uh, crypto tokens. There's no information really to let you know whether something's legit or whether it's a rug. It's incredibly hard to tell. Uh, the temptation to get involved is huge. And so um, it's, uh, there's lots of money pouring into it and it's very tempting for developers to, to rug it when they see that amount of um, stuff pouring in. I don't know what mouse farm tokens are. I, I, there's so much going on that sometimes you can't really keep track of it. I, assume, I think you can farm anything these days. Mice, cake, um, it's all part of the same thing. But there's no one to hold your hand in crypto. The pump and dump. There's a saying in the old scam literature that you can't cheat an honest man. Uh, here's about a minute of W.C. Fields doing that routine. Listen, you'll hear from me. That's uh, fine. <coughs> Don't telegraph, Roy. There's been a mistake in my change. Ah, uh, long last an honest man. What do 
return some money? No, I'm short. Don't brag about it. I'm only five feet eight for sound. Uh, I mean, I'm short in my money. No mistake, Rick. You buy that afterwards, leaving the window. You're dishonest. Dishonest? Me, Shaq, Shadrack, and Abednego. You cheated us. Sal, you impugned my honor. It's my dear old grandfather, Lickbox, said, just before they sprung the trap, he said, you can't cheat an honest man. Never give a sucker an even break or smarten up a chump. We want what's coming to us. Uh, I'm gonna get it, too. You are? Yeah. You, too? Yeah, come on, give it to us. You are certainly both gonna get it. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean, my kid? Come on, come on, come on. Big So you can't cheat an honest man, never give a sucker an even break or smarten up a chump. Well, it's not, it's just not of course true that you can't cheat an honest man, but there's a diluted version of that. I mean, in some cases, the scam revolves around that. The cry for help scam that we saw revolves around the idea that you can't cheat an honest man. If you hadn't tried to steal his crypto, he wouldn't have been able to steal your ether. Um, in pump and dumps, we see a slightly diluted version of, of that idea, which is that uh, you think the deal is loaded in your favor when in fact it's loaded against. So here's Trump's pumps and dumps. <laughs> I don't think it's actually Donald Trump, but uh, who knows, possibly. And what they're doing is they're saying that they're gonna pump a coin, they ramp it up with a countdown, they get all of their followers in Telegram uh, heated in expectation. And the idea is that when they announce the coin, you jump in, the coin pumps, and you make lots of money. Except that's not what's really happening. What's really happening is that they've been buying the coin already a long time before they pump it. And when you buy it, supposedly on the pump announcement, what you're doing is providing them with excellent liquidity. In other words, they've bought low and they want to sell high. They need someone to sell to. Well, that's you. And so you're buying their coins as they're selling them out. And what you see is these incredible pumps the call there was made at six o'clock. I couldn't get six o'clock because it only does it an hour, so I've got 5.40 there. So actually the point at which you knew to buy that coin, you were almost up at the top of the peak anyway. And they've been buying it all the way up and they're selling it into that pump right up to the top where it gets to a point they think right now it's the top, we're gonna let it all go. Um, you think you're getting pumped, you're actually getting dumped. And that's the visual representation of what's happening to you there. Um, one of the things that makes this so successful is a thing called the gambler's fallacy, where you tend to think that you were quite close to winning it, and maybe you should try again. So the gambler's fallacy, if you play the fruit machines, you get, you're looking for three cherries, you get two cherries, and you get a pineapple, but the third cherry was just there, it almost came down. You were so close, you should try again. Well, this one, it has that same sort of mechanism about it. You were so close, you just needed to get in a bit earlier, and maybe you would have made some more money. And so they end up extorting um, from the same clientele in tranches over and over and over again. It's not even a one-hit scam. It's something that goes on and on. And then finally, perhaps the classic, the Ponzi scheme. Pretty old routines, Ponzi schemes. A Ponzi scheme is an investment vehicle that pays out existing subscribers using proceeds received from new recruits. It's inherently unstable for that reason. They always fall apart in the end. But the profits made by those who are first through the door are made at the expense of those who come later. And in spring 2021, earlier this year, there was a rash of tokens, meme-based tokens, that um, got purported to sort of reinvent finance by calling themselves auto-staking. And basically what happens is they're not really doing anything other than every time there's a transaction, they take a 5% or 10% transaction fee and they redistribute that transaction fee to existing holders of the token using uh, the coins that they've got at their disposal. So you buy in and you get more coins, the more people buy in. And hopefully the thing gets bigger and bigger. Just like the DEXs were all food related, these ones are all animal related, um, mostly dogs. I guess if, it, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Um, I pulled a roadmap for one of these to show you just exactly what sort of thing you're dealing with. Often if it's a legit crypto project, there'll be a roadmap which has milestones on it. They'll publish that for investors. So you might want to sort of think about looking at that if you're thinking about investing. Maybe they're going to make some technology or, um, or build a bridge to conventional finance and they'll have these sort of phases. Here's the phases of a, of a dog Ponzi. Phase one, make a website get listed, you have to get the, the listings of those uh, charts that I've been producing. If you don't get listed, there'll be no chart, nobody will be able to find you. There's no real 
vetting process for getting listed is more just a queue that you join. So make a website, get listed, commence heavy marketing. Phase two, continue heavy marketing. Telegram members, Telegram members. Phase three, continue heavy marketing. <laughs> this is 100% marketing. There's nothing else going on here besides marketing. Um, there was, a, I think it was JFK's dad, Joe Kennedy, who uh, famously said, um, if the shoeshine boy's giving you stock tips, it's time to sell everything. If there's dog Ponzi schemes being advertised in Times Square in New York, it's time to get out of the crypto market. I saw this. I didn't get out of the crypto market. I should have. I, I, the alarm bells were ringing. And it didn't work. So there's an, a, a sort of accelerated capitalist logic about these Ponzi schemes. The, the weird thing that happens is that the more that people recognize what's going on, and now people have pretty much started to recognize what's going on, it turns into gambling. And um, you know that the only way that you're going to win is by front-running everybody else. You've got to get in and out really quickly before the whole thing collapses. But everybody knows that now, so everybody's trying to front-run everybody else. So what you get is these huge initial pumps in the first few hours, and then massive dumps that just go down into nothing. Loads of people lose lots of money. Some people win some money in the early stages, but it's that sort of pushing forward of the timeline. I mean, crypto is a very accelerated timeline for things, <laughs> most things anyway. So here's the conclusion. New technology, new economy, familiar criminal routines. We've stepped out of the world of conventional finance and we found a lot that's new, but we haven't really found much about the scams that's new, have we? What we found is more like endless variations on old themes of enticement, deception, confidence tricks, like DeFi, which itself has classic themes, and endless variations, the pancakes and the unicorns and the sushi and what have you. And like memes too, which circulate in a constant evolving stream of repetition and slight alteration. Criminal fraud here has become a DeFi meme, repeated ad nauseam in a vortex of permutations of some common basic roots. And so if you are pumped and dumped, or if you're rug pulled, or if you ape too late into a Ponzi token, if you send Bitcoin to an address in the hope of getting more back, or if you fall for a honeypot cry for help scam, you are part of an old story of crime and deception that's been playing out since long before cryptocurrency was the hot new money-making scheme. Old wine and new bottles, you might say, or plus à change, or maybe, as our crypto DJ and friends would say, same shit, different day. Now, if you go home tonight and tell people that you went to a professorial and all go lecture and the conclusion was same shit, different day, <laughs> the reputation might never recover. Um, if, you, if you can bear with me for two more minutes, if anyone wants to leave, that's fine. Please do, please do. I realize I've gone a little bit over. But I'd like to do a couple of acknowledgements. I'd like to say um, thanks to the university and to all the wonderful people who work here, and of course my friends in the School of Social and Cultural Studies and the Institute of Criminology, um, excellent scholars and, and, and teachers and, and fun and rewarding places um, to be academic. The second acknowledgement is the European Research Council who provided the funding that supported the research, and my colleagues on the wider project that this is a, a small part of, they are Donna Yates and Annette Hubschle and um, Diana Berzina at the Universities of Maastricht and Cape Town. And then I want to uh, mention and thank four academics who've been particularly influential in my career. Peter Young was the professor who first taught me criminology at Edinburgh University. And um, as Grant said, I went on to be a lawyer for three years after that until I realized that I really wanted to be a criminologist. So I went back to speak to Peter about whether it was possible to be a criminologist as a profession. And he said, yeah, sure it is. And uh, you should go to Cambridge which uh, I never would have thought of. And he said, you should apply for a scholarship to Cambridge. And here's the forms to fill out as well. Uh, and so thanks to him, this all happened. Um, an amazing sort of early support, show of support. And then at Cambridge, I met Ken Polk, who would be my PhD supervisor. He was visiting from Melbourne at the time. And he said, you should come to Melbourne and, and do a PhD. And so I did, and he taught me all about white collar crime. And um, the end uh, of the PhD, I told him that Sally and I were going to move back to London, and he said, you should go and see Penny Green, um, who was the professor of criminology at uh, the University of Westminster at the time. And um, so I did go to see Penny Green, and it turns out she was looking for a lecturer in criminology and criminal law, so she gave me my first job in academia. And um, Penny is somebody who 
personifies the link between social justice and criminology. She was, the, I always kind of knew it, but um, she really did it. The idea that criminology can change the world for the better. Um, I think that's uh, something that, that Penny sort of lives by. She's now the, the head of the International State Crime Initiative. Um, after that, I went to Keele University. I was a lecturer there for a little bit. Uh, there's too many people there to say hi to, so if, if anybody's watching the video, hello, and, and um, thanks for all the fun times. And then at Glasgow, for I was there for 10 years before I came here, and I worked with Michelle Berman, now Michelle Berman OBE, who, um, as well as being a fantastic scholar, has the rare skill to be able to um, inspire other people to be their best. She sets up structures that allow other people to succeed. It's a very selfless and clever thing to do, and she certainly did it for me. She, she, she um, is a large part of the reason why, what success I've had, uh, I've had. And so I want to tell these people that they are valued and to uh, acknowledge them and tell them that I'm basically now spending most of my career trying to pay forward the kindness and the generosity that they showed to me, um, thoroughly decent human beings and, and good friends. Now, I didn't become a Bitcoin millionaire, but I did get a Lambo. Do you want to see it? This is me taking it for a test drive. Ah! <laughs> so you've got to watch out for scams. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thanks for listening. Namana ena reo ena karanga rangamaha tena koto katoa namihi nui kia koto kwate mai ne itene po kite fakarongo kite korero wahapu o aurangi Simon McKenzie ko Sarah Leggett a uh, takuingwa ko hoteamo o te wahanga aranui. Um, good evening. I'm Professor Sarah Leggett. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, Te Wahanga Aranui, and it's my privilege this evening to offer the vote of thanks on behalf of us all to Professor Simon McKenzie for his excellent inaugural lecture as Professor of Criminology at Te Heringawaka, Victoria University of Wellington. Professor Simon McKenzie is an internationally renowned expert in the field of global illegal markets. His groundbreaking scholarship has advanced both a practical and theoretical understanding of global criminal trade, from trafficking in drugs and arms to the illicit trade of wildlife, diamonds and antiquities, through to the extreme harm caused by the terrible reality of human trafficking. But this evening, Simon has taken us into a new realm of illicit trade and transnational criminal activity with his analysis of the scams currently flourishing in the new and alternate financial system that is the crypto market. Simon's insightful and entertaining inaugural professorial lecture this evening has given us all a glimpse of the high-tech, potentially high-yield, yet undoubtedly high-risk world of crypto. This is a world that is, or at least was until this evening, very unfamiliar to me and I imagine to many people in the room tonight. So we've all learned a great deal, Simon, from your inaugural lecture and we're immensely appreciative. A relatively new and a highly technological space, the unregulated global economy that is the crypto market is a space of speed, volatility and opportunity seemingly rife with manipulation and deception. The growth of crypto trading via decentralized exchanges with the lack of regulation facilitates deceptive and criminal activity, from low-level scams and fraud to tax evasion and money laundering. Simon has introduced us to some of the schemes, new schemes such as the pump and dump and rug pulls, and schemes that maybe were more, are more familiar to us. 
But what's more, Simon's lecture this evening has given us a fascinating insight into the whole new language and culture that have emerged from crypto trading that he has helpfully translated for us. From the shilling of coins to moonshots, from blue chips to shit coins, terms probably necessitating less translation, the need to consider pumpamentals of a project, from FOMO and of course through to the ultimate aspiration of the Lambo. This is a world that for many of us is new, unfamiliar, modern, and seems both complex and somewhat intimidating. But what Simon has argued in his illuminating inaugural tonight is that this world and its associated practices of deception is not really so new nor innovative, that the deception and scams in the market are versions of age-old criminal ruses. And considering the impact and harm of these scams, I think Simon's own words from his earlier book on transnational criminology are pertinent. There, Simon describes trafficking as a form of morally indifferent capitalism, suggesting that in a generally hostile and uncompassionate world, criminal markets are underpinned by a globalization of indifference, in which crime and the harm caused by illegal markets is compartmentalized overlooked. In a similar vein, Simon has spoken this evening of the way in which the scams and deception in crypto trading have become normalized, are considered to come with the territory in this unregulated wild west, and that traders are expected to take personal responsibility for the implications of their activity in this market. We're therefore also grateful to Simon for highlighting this. Because thanks to tonight's inaugural lecture, if we should choose to venture into this unregulated speculative world, we'll be forewarned to be alert to degen plays, to look out for whales, to not to succumb to FOMO, and to avoid aping too late as we navigate the complex crypto market. So thank you, Simon, for sharing these insights. This is fascinating and highly informative work, and your inaugural has, I think, highlighted for us that we are extremely fortunate to have such an internationally renowned scholar here as Professor of Criminology at Te Heringa Waka, Victoria University of Wellington. It's now my pleasure to invite everyone to stay and join us for refreshments in the foyer outside the lecture theatre. But before we adjourn there, please join me in thanking our Rangi Simon McKenzie again for an excellent inaugural lecture.